start us off with a devotional. I'm um, just something God's been speaking to my heart. And then we, as a church family, are going to come to God's throne, and we're going to believe for some things tonight, okay? And so I'll direct us in that. Um, but I am excited that you're here. How many of you are here this morning to start the relationship goals? How many of you walked away with something you want to work on? Yes, all of you. Please, if you did not raise your hand, we need to always be working on something. We have not arrived yet in our walk with Christ. And so I want to encourage you. Um, sometimes it's hard to admit our fault. Yeah? Yeah? Ever been in an interview and they ask you what your weakness is? You can name other people's weakness, but it's really hard to name your own, right? You can name your spouse or your best friend or your kid's weakness, but it's really hard to name your own. So I just ask you, man, every time you're in God's presence, just continue to ask him, what can I be working on in my life? Because I know that I have not arrived yet. Amen. So tonight we are going to just do... Um, just a little bit of an, a devotion tonight, and it's something that God's kind of been speaking to me and stirring in my heart. Um, so we're going to open to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we are going to read um, the first few scriptures in this chapter. If you do not have a Bible or you don't have your phone, it's right up here behind me. Uh, we're going to read verses 1 through 13, and this is the NIV version. It says, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you mourn for Saul? since I have rejected him as king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Amen. So I'm just going to pray over us, and then I'm just going to speak to you just a little bit this morning, or this evening. And I want to talk to you about not being overlooked that you are not overlooked. And so, Lord, I just invite you here tonight. I ask that you would be with us. I pray that you would speak to each one of us where we are. I thank you that you see us, that we matter to you, that we are of value to you, that you care for each one of us. And so, Lord, I just pray for your presence in this place. I pray that you would be with us and that you would continue to make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you remember the game Hide and Seek? I know, you probably still play it, right? I have to tell you, when we started having kids, um, Javen was probably about two years old, and um, Pastor Cindy, a.k.a. Nana, used to love to play this game with Javen. And Javen is the worst person at Hide and Seek because he wants you to know where he is. 
Ever played with somebody like that? They can't be quiet for anything, but they giggle or they laugh or they snort. And so um, Pastor Cindy Nana had to make the game go longer than it should. And then eventually Javen just jumps out. And he's like, I'm over here. Because he wanted to be found so badly. Well, we're going to read a little bit about that tonight. About God seeing you exactly where you are. It says in these first couple of scriptures that the Lord tells Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? And it's interesting that we have Samuel, who used to be a judge, and now... Saul, you know, is the first king of Israel, and it's the king that who chose? The people chose. They asked for him. And so he's become a king, and all of a sudden, he's not doing a good job. And Samuel is mourning over this. And God tells him, stop mourning. A couple weeks ago, I shared on seasons, there's a time for everything. And I see in here very clearly that God said, enough is enough, Samuel. Stop mourning for him. I'm going to put somebody else in that spot that I choose. Verse 1 says, the Lord said, I choose who goes in there next. And so God had chosen another king, and this was going to be from the family of Jesse. It says that in verse 2, then Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it, and he will want to kill me. Ever been scared of something? I love when the Bible highlights the emotions of what people are going through because we know we're not the only ones who experience it. But Samuel was afraid. He was afraid of what would happen if Saul found out that he was looking to anoint another king. Would you be pretty mad if you were in that position and you knew you were about to be replaced? And the very person who anointed you was going to anoint another. And so very clearly Samuel said he was scared. You see, when Saul was anointed king, it was a very public event. It was done in front of everyone because they wanted it. And scripture says here that God was going to anoint a new king in private. He was going to do it in just a small, intimate setting, and it was not going to be done in front of everyone. And so scripture says that God told Samuel he needed to go. How many of you know that's the hardest part? Just go. Just go. Just go do it. He said, take a cow, invite Jesse and his family, and God would do the rest. Those are the hardest things to do is go and rely on Jesus. How many of you like to plan? You like to know every detail of what's going to happen? So if God erases some of those plans and just shows you number one and number four, how many of you would be intimidated by that? And God said, go take a cow. I'm going to do the rest. And so here goes Samuel. It says in verses four and five, Samuel did what the Lord said, and when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? You see, when a judge would arrive to a town, was it usually good news? No, it usually meant that some type of judgment was coming upon you. How many of you want to be the judge? (laughs) You probably had no friends. Nobody wants to hang out with you. Nobody wants to be seen with you. And so here comes Samuel, and as soon as he arrives to Bethlehem, they said, oh, no, do you come in peace? Because all of a sudden, their future just flashed before their eyes. What's going to happen to us? You see, the exact fear um, that you see here is Samuel had that of Saul. The town of Bethlehem had that fear of Samuel coming. They were scared. They're Fear was maybe there was a divine judgment about to happen to them. Maybe he was going to deliver news that was going to change the course of that, of that town. And it says Samuel had to assure them, no, I come in peace. I'm not coming to bring a judgment. I'm coming in peace, but I'm actually coming to present a sacrifice before you. 
And so he invited Jesse and seven of his sons to come. And we see in verses 6 and 7 that um, they arrived, Jesse arrived with his sons. And as soon as Samuel saw Eliab, who was the firstborn, he knew in his own heart, surely this is the one that God is going to anoint king. It says that he was um, strong in appearance, that he was a handsome guy. And as soon as he presented himself and he had the tall stature of what they would assume a king would look like, inside of Samuel's heart, he said, he's the one. How many of you know that sometimes we make a mistake even in our own heart and God's like, nope. Oh, no. Maybe you've decided to do something and you chose from your own heart, your own mind. And God said, what did you just do? You didn't even consult with me. You didn't even ask me. And so God tells Samuel, don't look at his outward appearance, but be like me and look at his heart. And this is not the one. And it says, Jesse called the second son and the third son and so on. How many of you can remember back when you were in school and you had the horrible, horrible time of being in a PE class and they picked two captains and you got to pick teams? Do you dread those days? And you're the person that's not athletic in any way, but yet you know you're going to be one of the last two people chosen to be on the team. It could be any sport, kickball, softball, baseball, soccer. You just know, oh, I'm, I'm just going to sit down because out of the 30 kids in this class, I will be number 29 or 30. I guarantee you. Remember those days? You can see this picture behind me from a movie. I think it's the Sandlot, right? You can just look at that team. That was not the ideal team to pick, right? Not the ideal team. But I love that God does not pick us according to what we look like on the outside. But he picks us on what we look like on the inside. There's a saying that says, don't judge a book by its cover. Have you ever picked up a book and you look at it and go, there's no way this is a good book. Because whoever did the artwork on the outside of this book really messed it up for the author. <laughs> but then sometimes you read it and you're like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And then you read some more, and then you don't want to put it down. And then by the end, you're like, wow, I'm going to keep this. I actually might read this one again. Don't judge a book by its cover. One of my first jobs uh, right out of high school, I worked for mailboxes, et cetera. That's dating myself because I think now they're all the UPS store, correct? Um, I remember when I was working there, a man came in. I was up in Cottonwood. A man came into the store, and I was convinced that he was a homeless man. And he came in, and he had a smell, a little bit of a smell. He had um, clothes that were not very appealing. And he came in with this paper. It was all folded up really small in his pocket. And he pulled it out, and it took a long time. This was like a, you know, a five-minute unfold. And he just, like, he didn't say anything. He just kind of was just making it straight. And he asked me for a copy. And I was like, yeah. So I went and made a copy. I came back and I gave him the copy and it was like five cents, seven cents. And he said, thank you. And then he walked out very slowly. It was like a really slow walk. And he left. He was maybe in his late 50s. And I didn't think anything of who he was. And then just a few minutes later, the owner of the mailboxes, et cetera, came to me. And he's like, oh, I didn't get to say hi. He realized that he had just left. He said, oh, I didn't get to say hi to so-and-so. I was like, you know him? He's like, well, you won't believe this, but he's probably the wealthiest guy in this entire valley. And I was like, that's a joke, right? He's like, oh, no, no. He owns all, he just told me everything he owned and where he lived. He said he lost his wife a few years ago, and he just, he just is sad. So he just kind of walks everywhere. And I thought, wow, you really cannot judge a book by its cover. We see here in this chapter that Israel's king 
You see, Samuel's looking for someone who looked the part, and the firstborn had that appearance. Israel's first king, if you remember in scripture, Saul, it says that he was a head above everyone else from the shoulders up. He was a very tall man. He had the appearance of the king. And so that's who the people chose. And now God was going to give them a king that they needed. Not that they wanted, but one that they needed. Said Jesse's sons all went by one by one. Seven of them went by. And each time somebody went by, God kept saying, no, no, no. And if I'm Samuel, I have to be getting very discouraged at this point because I see the last one sitting there, and he's about to come, and I'm like, if he says no to this one, I'm just going to look like an idiot because I came here to anoint somebody, and then God just said, no, 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 no. And all of a sudden we see in Scripture, it says... Are these all of your sons? And all of a sudden, Jesse replies, well, they're still the youngest one, but he's out tending the sheep. And just by that scripture, I think all these things in my head. As a dad, he's saying, hmm, is he really worth going to get? I mean, look who I brought before you. My number is one through seven. You want me to go get him? I mean, I got all this land. I have no idea where he's at. He's just out there with the sheep somewhere. And you see Samuel's response. He said, yes, I will not sit until you bring him to me. And I love thinking of that from the perspective of Jesus. That when he looks at you, he says, yes, you're valuable and you're worth it, and I will not sit down until you come to me, until you come home to me. Says that the youngest son finally arrives, and it says that as soon as he comes in, the Bible gives a clear description that he was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Other versions say he was glowing. That he was glowing when he came in. How many of you love to sing worship when you're by yourself? How many of you, when you're in the car, you're the best worship leader you ever heard? Yeah? Um, My son, Javen, don't tell him this, but when he goes in the shower, it's like full-blown recording session. Like, he's all there. And me and Jay are like, he's got to be taking a shower because he sings so loud and so passionately. And when I picture David in the fields where nobody's at, I mean, he can see as far as the eye can see. All he's got is his sheep. I can just see him worshiping and singing and loving Jesus. And so when they bring him in, he's glowing. He's just glowing. His presence shows that he's been before the king. And so they bring him in. And just like the other brothers, he's good looking. I'm really glad they didn't say he was ugly and unattractive. (laughs) But they said he also was handsome features and a good looking boy. And so they bring him in. And all of a sudden, without hesitation, God tells him, God tells Samuel, rise and anoint him. He's the one. He's the one. And there's two powerful things that happen in this scripture. It says, from that day on, the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. From that day on. If you know anything about Saul, previous to this, you know that Saul only received the spirit sporadically. The Bible does not say that he was filled with the Spirit every single day from that day on when he was anointed king. But it says that the Spirit only came upon Saul sporadically. But Scripture is very clear. As soon as they said, this is the one, the Spirit of the Lord fell upon David from this day forward. And he had that anointing upon him. We learn, it says right here in in, in verse...
13, it says, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. Did you know this is the first time the name of David is mentioned in the Bible? The very first time is when they anoint him king. And the very last time David's mentioned in the Bible is in Revelation 22, the very last book of the Bible. And so from 1 Samuel chapter 16 to Revelation 22, you will hear the name of David over 1,000 times. Because that is how important he was. And God had a plan for him. And I want to encourage you tonight that God sees you where you are. David could have been content in the field just singing songs to Jesus and taking care of all the animals. And he probably just would have been just as happy because he had Jesus. And I know that there's some of you sometimes when you're sitting there and you think, does God even know what I'm going through? Does he even understand where I'm at right now? Does he understand how heartbroken I am or how frustrated I am or how needy I am or how lonely I am? But God sees you where you are and he cares for you. He sees you. He hears you. He knows everything about you and he's still crazy for you. Jay was talking this morning about when you fall in love with people. Kind of after a while, those tingly feelings go away. Those never go away from God's view on you. But they're always there because he loves you so much. We're going to do a little bit in prayer tonight. And so I want to encourage you. I'm going to put some prayer points up here, and then we're going to pray. And if you feel comfortable just sitting where you are, you are totally fine to do that. Some of you I know like to walk around. Some of you just like to stand. Some of you like to just be in different positions when you're praying. But we're going to go to God's throne together as a family, a family of God. And we're going to bring some requests before him. And so first, I want to start with thanking God that he sees us where we are. And so I want to encourage you for the next two to three minutes, I just want you to lift your voice and just to say, thank you, God, that you've seen me where I am, that you've taken me from point A to point B. Maybe some of you was 60 years ago, but he did it for you. <laughs> 